Good morning, everyone. So, um, in case you guys don't know me, my name is Trexler Prophet. Um, I'm the new uh, student pastor here. I've been here for a few months. Uh, I think most of you I've met or you've introduced me to yourself, and I may or may not remember your name if you come up to me again. I'm still working on that. Um, so I know that I may be a little younger, a little better looking than what you're used to seeing up here on Sunday mornings, but I promise you I've got something good to say, so I just hope that you'll stick with me, all right? So if you want to go ahead and go and find the book of Matthew, it's a pretty easy one to find. Um, this morning we're going to be talking about the Great Commission, and I think it's, it's kind of funny because I was actually going to give this sermon a while back, but then I got COVID. And so now I'm, I'm here, and it's funny because we're doing the International Mission Board, um, Lottie Moon, and all that thing, so it's kind of like God just made me wait until it was a little bit more relevant, you know, so I think it's really cool how it happened. Um, so if you're, a, if you're a note taker or you want a title, you know, the idea today is making disciples or making excuses. Um, and we're going to just dig into this passage that I think many of us, including myself until not that long ago, kind of get wrong when we read. And a lot of times we, we kind of take it the wrong way. So let's just go ahead and dig in in verse 18. Or verse 19, sorry. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you, and remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. So I would, I would bet, not I wouldn't, but that most of you have probably heard this before if you've been in church more than twice. So one of the first things that I think we get caught up on and we kind of maybe get wrong in a sense is the word go. A lot of times when you hear this passage, the emphasis is on go. It's always go, 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 do, do, do. Well, the thing is, that's actually kind of not the case. Um, if you look at it, this idea of go is really just a prerequisite to the idea of making disciples. Focusing on the go is not really the right thing because we should focus on making the disciples. Um, if you look at the, um, the grammar, and I am not an English or Greek professional at all, but the idea is that go is an aortis participle. So, in other words, you can read it like this, as you are going. See, the idea is not, the command is not to go. The idea is, you should already be going. As a Christian, you should already be going and moving and doing. And as you are doing that, then comes in the command. But we're going to look just a little bit more at go, real quick. Um, but as a follower of Christ, we should be making disciples no matter where we are or when it is, like, Go is not really an option. Go is the most basic thing. It's just where we need to start. So go for the disciples was an international intent. You know, when Jesus said go make disciples of all nations, you know, go to every corner of the earth, he literally meant go scatter yourselves across the world. And that's great. And, you know, we have the IMB, we have Lottie Moon, we have those things that we've been talking about that are, going that are helping us spread that world that word internationally but just because that the focus is international it does not mean we can neglect the local area um going across the world is great but i mean there's even other other states in the united states that we need to go to there's you know there's other cities in mississippi that we can go to I mean, there's even other streets in Greenville that we can go to. The idea of go, while, yes, it was intended to be international, Jesus didn't mean only go out of the country and don't tell anybody around you about Jesus. Like, I, on your way out, let everybody know and bring them with you. The idea of go is international, but you can't neglect local. And so the other thing about go is that it doesn't always have to be a physical thing. Um, for a lot of people, physically going isn't an option, you know. Um, work, health, whatever it may be, physically going isn't going to happen. But that doesn't mean you can't go. So there's all kinds of ways to go, you know. 
You can go by, you know, literally hopping on the plane and flying to another country. You can go by being the person that funds someone else and helps them, you know, that I, I went by paying for this person to go because I'm unable to, but they may not have the money, um, but they have the time, and I don't have the time, but I have the money, so together we go, you know. Maybe you don't have either one of those. Um, <laughs> I know personally, I don't have the money, and I don't have the time, <laughs> um, you know, but that still doesn't mean there's not ways that I can't go. Like, I know um, that there are ways, like, you can just be a prayer warrior, you know, for every one person that's going, that's doing, that's overseas, whatever it is, there ought to be a million people behind them just praying. Even if you can't give a penny, you can go by just praying and supporting that person. Um, I mean, I know back in Marion, I have people, that were, I knew every time that we went on a mission trip, there were people that were like, I'm praying for you. When I said that, when they said that, like, I knew they meant it because like there are these Two or three ladies that when they said, I'm praying for you, I was like, these people have like a direct line. They can like pick up the phone and like it's gotten them like a perfect connection, like closer than anyone ever. Like when, when they speak, like he listens to them. Um, so you can be that person. Um, and so I think that going is kind of funny because a lot of times we treat going like maybe like visiting an in-law or uh, starting a diet. Uh, <laughs> or like going on a run, you know? It's always fun, like, visiting your in-laws. It's fun until that day. And it's like, oh, we actually have to go see the mother-in-law. Or starting a diet is fun until you read the book about keto and you're like, I can't have cookies, I can't have sugar, I can't have my Diet Coke, I can't have my fried chicken, um, carbs. <laughs> like, that's what I live off of. Or like starting a run, thinking about that, it's fun until you think of, I'm going to actually have to run, and I'm not going to be in danger. I'm just running for fun. Like, you'll never catch me. You'll never catch me. You know, it's, it's always fun until you realize it's going to hurt a little bit. Um, you know, everybody wants to go until they realize it's going to hurt. It's going to take sacrifice. It won't be easy, you know. But on the flip side of that, um, when our team is playing on Saturday, uh, when – Deer season, duck season, whatever you want to be, whatever it hits. Um, when our favorite store has a sale, that's, that one's personal. Um, whatever it may be, you know, we have no issues emptying our calendar, writing that big old check, doing what it takes to do to go. It's like, oh, yeah, it's the Egg Bowl, which who cares? Go, go Hogs. It's the Egg Bowl this week. Whatever we're going to do, I'm going to empty my calendar. I will... I will, I will eat ramen noodles and water for a month if that's what it takes to get those front row tickets. You know, when it's deer season, it's like, all right, I'm going to, I don't deer hunt, so I don't know. You get that one. When it's, <laughs> when it's um, our favorite store has a sale, when Black Friday, Cyber Monday hits, you're like, oh, you know, I didn't need that when it was $1,000, but I need it now because it's 500 even though you don't, you know? But then it's like, I'll do what I need to do to go for this. But at the same time, when the youth need a chaperone for camp, um, when we're just trying to fund a mission trip, um, when the little evil children that I do not like to deal with need someone to help in child care, oh, sorry, I'm too busy, you know. I have plans, you know. I have to sit in here and listen to some guy talk instead. Um... Uh, I'm too broke, you know, sorry, I spent all my money already. So I think the problem for us nowadays is not going. I think the problem is where we go and why we go. Um, I just, I mean, it's like, it's, it's crazy day. Like, you, you can go on a Saturday, you can go do whatever you want, but then on Sunday morning, mm, tired. Sorry. Or Wednesday night, Oh, so we had a long day at work. We had a long day at school. Sorry. But on any other day of the week, it's like, oh, yeah, I, I don't care if I'm driving down the road, hitting the rumble strips. I'm going. But Sunday morning in church, if, even if my, someone beside me has to give me a little elbow every now and then, sorry. No, I can't do it. So I think what we need to remember is I like this quote by John Piper. And it says, all he said is, go, send, or disobey. It's, it's that simple. 
one or the other. And I know you're probably up here like, this guy's talking about going and difficult and like, he lives, he lives in his little bachelor pad with his apartment. He's got all the time in the world. Well, I promise you, I know that going can be difficult. Um, just a few months ago, I packed up a U-Haul and moved down here. Um, and not to say anything negative about anyone, but it was one of the toughest parts of my life. Like, I, granted, I'm not that old. I haven't had a lot of tough things to deal with yet. But it was one of the toughest things I've had to deal with. Move into a new church that is completely different than any other church I've ever been at moving to a new part of the, I guess I'm still in the Delta in Marion, but moving to a new part of the country that is completely different than going back home to Marion or West Memphis, moving a few hours away from my family, like, I promise you it's not easy. And like, one thing um, I think was kind of funny that I really, that I learned in this whole process was how much we take for granted a washer and a dryer. And now some of the people down here are laughing because they know. For the first month I was here, I didn't have a washer or a dryer. So every time I put on a shirt, I was like, I was stressed because I was like, I cannot get anything on this shirt because I have to wear it three more times until I go home and I can do laundry. I was like, I don't have the money. I said, I'm not going to a laundromat. I said, I have way too much pride, which is my fault, to ask someone if I could come over to borrow their laundry, to to do a load of laundry. And And I said, if it gets down to it, I'll just do it in the sink or the bathtub. And I was like, I did not want that to have to happen. But I promise you, like, going is not easy, and I'm not just up here making it up. Like, I know from experience. But, you know, like I said, the main point of the Great Commission is about making disciples. So let's talk about that for a minute. So what does making disciples mean, first of all? Or what, is, what even is a disciple? And so, like I said, I'm no professional at Greek, and I'm not going to try to pronounce any of the words but I did a little a looking up, and the word disciple, it literally means a committed learner or follower, or one who follows. So making disciples means to raise up people that are, one, committed, two, learners, and three, followers. And those all kind of go hand in hand, right? So the thing that I think we get wrong about making disciples is in our minds, we think making disciples is where it says baptizing them. It's like, oh yeah, they said a prayer, they made a belief, they're a disciple, I'm out. Peace. But if you look at what a disciple means, that's not the whole battle. That's just the start of it. Um, making a disciple goes way more than just having a person tell you they believe in Jesus. Um, way more than having them repeat a prayer, whatever it may be. It means leading them in a life that shows that that was legit, that shows that that was true. Um, It means like being a guide, being a teacher, um, being whatever it may, whatever they may need to become a more committed follower of Christ. And I think another thing we like to do, and again, when I say we, like, this is all myself too. I'm not trying to cast blame on people. I'm right in here. It's saying that like, Making disciples is just the job of the pastors and the deacons. It's like, oh, you know, um, that's, let their Sunday school teacher deal with that. Or uh, we'll just let, we'll let Matt deal with that or Trexler or Susan or which, however old they may be. Um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll call, let them call a deacon. Like, I know they're having a rough time, so I'll tell a deacon and call them instead of I doing it. Because that's, that's the deacon. That's what they're there for, right? But that's totally not true. Um, one of my favorite verses it says, and you've, I'm sure you've all heard this, Proverbs 27, 17. It says, it's iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Do you know what it does not say? It says, so one pastor sharpens everybody else, or so one deacon sharpens the church. It doesn't say, so one Sunday school, sharp, Sunday school teacher sharpens all the youth, and some child care workers sharpen all the children. It says, one man sharpens another because... It is our job as a community of Christ to sharpen each other. It's not just on the pastors, just on the preachers, the deacons, the whoever you may think that are the whatever, you know, it's it's on everybody. It's a um the command was for all the disciples, it was it was a communal command to make disciples. He said, You make disciples, you, 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 all of you. And that's the same as us. It's every single one of us is charged with making disciples. And then I think that command is just, it goes to the end of the day. It's like, it's not ever going to end. So I've kind of 
talked about this, that it's an ongoing command. You see, if we're going to make disciples, it's something that we're going to continue to do. But first, in making disciples, we have to check ourselves first because we need to make sure what we're making them a disciple of, right? So I like to think of this idea as like a kitchen sponge. It's kind of gross. Um, you like wash all your dishes, you do whatever you need to do, you clean everything, and it's nasty and dirty, right? You know, that's us without Jesus. Wiped around the world, nasty, full of sin, gross. But then you take that sponge and you put it under the faucet, you put, take that sinner and you put them under Christ, the living water, and what happens to the sponge? It's clean again, right? And so then that's where probably most of us in the room would be. But it's what you do with that after that what really matters. So you can either take that sponge and go clean some more other stuff, get all nasty and dirty and greasy again, and then it's just going to keep spreading that stuff around, right? Or you can take it and keep it under the water, so then every time you squeeze it, that same water comes out. Now, it's obviously the water's not going to be as perfect, as clean as when it went in, but it's water compared to nasty and grease. So we need to make sure as we're making disciples that we're constantly having that living water coming from us and coming out and that we're not taking the whatever nasty stuff we soak up from the world, whether it may be something really bad or just a love for something that's not too terrible, that instead of spreading that, we're taking the living water, the cleanliness, the, the good stuff, and we're spreading that. Um, because in the end, if we're making disciples for the wrong reasons, then we're not really making disciples at all. Um, so we know who is called to make disciples. We see kind of how to prepare ourselves to make them. But that's still not the end of it yet. So what now, what exactly does making a disciple look like? So discipleship is the art and the science of helping people find, follow, and become like Jesus. Discipleship happens as God people show love, share truth, and live life with one another, making new disciples along the way. That's, it's that simple, but it's not. So this is going to sound crazy, but discipling someone doesn't always mean that you wake up every morning and have a Bible study with them. Now, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that. Like, any time you spend in the Word trying to grow closer to God is amazing and it is great and it will bless you. But that is not the only way to disciple someone. Um, you know, discipling someone sometimes looks like just being a hoops coach for some kids. Sometimes it looks like maybe being a Sunday school teacher. Sometimes discipling someone can literally just be being a um, godly man or a godly woman that someone can look at and see an example of God, of Christ's love in them. You may not even do anything directly to another person. You can still disciple them. Um, you know, like Matt was talking about last week, how the church is reverent, but it doesn't mean quiet. Sometimes making a disciple just means singing at the top of your lungs when we're worshiping because other people around it, and they're going to hear it, and they're going to know that, man, that person, like, they're feeling it, and you know. Um, Maybe even they might sing a little louder so they don't have to hear you. That's probably what happens when I sing. Um, you know, sometimes it means maybe, and this one's going to brace yourselves. Maybe sometimes it means even when we're worshiping, like, lift a hand, you know, close your eyes, a little whatever. Like, it doesn't mean, maybe it just means, like, letting God just move through you. And sometimes that means physically moving. Um, sometimes it just means being a solid man, solid woman that someone else is looking at. You know, I have um, plenty of people in my lives, um, in my life, not my lives, in my life that I, I can think of. You know, there are guys in my church, Mr. Jimmy, um, you're not going to know these names, Mr. Fred, lots of guys that maybe they coach me in basketball or maybe they were just a Boy Scout leader for me or whatever it is. And they may not have ever literally sat down and read the Bible and said, all right, we're going to open it up. Here is um, the book of Esther, and here's what it means. And they probably never once hardly did that, but they were godly men that I could look at and say, okay, I can like, strive to be like them. Um, and obviously, 
my parents, my grandparents actually were like, would sit down and read the Bible, so don't think I'm ignoring them or they're watching too, so. But um, it may not always be obvious, but it is always possible to make, it's possible to make disciples in many ways. Like, I love Max Lucado, and he says this, in our faith, we follow in someone's steps. In our faith, we leave footprints to guide others. It's the principle of discipleship. So, it, see, it doesn't matter, always matter how you're doing it. It just matters that you're doing it. Like, it doesn't matter how you're making the footsteps. What's important is just making the footsteps. You may not ever see someone following in them. You may not ever even realize they're there. But when you're making them, you're making a difference. So, now I want to do something a little crazy. But I'm going to ask you a question, and I want you to answer. And now it's nothing embarrassing, nothing like that. I just want you to simply raise your hand if you've heard of the golden rule. That's what I thought. So, you know, it comes from um, Matthew. He says that the greatest commandment is loving the Lord. And then he says the second is to love your neighbor as yourself. So, what does this have to do with the Great Commission? Well, I think that this, this commandment here and the Great Commission go hand in hand to each other. And here's why. You can't love someone and also knowingly let them live a life that could destine them to hell and never say anything about it to them. I'm going to read that again. You can't truly love someone and also knowingly let them live a life that could destine them to hell and never say anything about it. So if we're going to love one another as ourselves, that means we're going to have to follow the Great Commission. We're going to have to make disciples. We're going to have to open our mouths and share that word. Um, you know, it's like Matt always says, um, bringing God, oh, I messed it up now. Bring God, ah, I can't I'll even try, I'm not even going to try, I forgot to write it down. About, about bring God glory as we gather and reaching lost souls as, souls as we scatter. There it is. Um, you have to scatter. You know, you have to it all is bringing God glory and sharing that love means actually going and doing it. And so the last little kicker here is one of my favorites, and this is where I'm going to go and probably get on a rant and talk about for a long time, is all nations. When it says, make disciples of all nations. Now, we think of nations sometimes literally as a country, and some of you have heard me talk about this part before, but nation can really mean any kind of people group. Um, nation can be mean, can mean like the nation of all the Mississippi State fans, the nation of all the Ole Miss fans, all the Arkansas fans, all the people from Mississippi, uh, whatever it may be. A nation can just think of it as a people group. Um, all nations means going to the corners of the earth without regard of race, religion, financial status, whatever barriers we like to put up, and I know we like to put them up. Um, one of my, um, the one thing that I'm sure a lot of you have heard me say, and I promise you, if I ever get up here again, you'll probably hear me say it again. Um, in Romans 8, Paul says this, I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Well, we know what that means. If we're going to reflect the love of Christ, if we're going to do our best to share the same love that Christ gave us, that means no height, no depth, no ruler, no thing present, thing to come, no socioeconomic status, no societal boundaries, no orientation, no difference in color, no whatever barrier, whatever wall, whatever nation you want to put a person in should separate us from also sharing that same love with them the way it was shared with us. Going to all nations means each and all nations, whether you want to or not. And then the last part, you know, after this, you're kind of feeling kind of beat up. You're like, well, dang, I, <laughs> this was rough. And then you get to the end, and it's just a good little encouragement. Verse 20, it says that, um, and remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Um, 
It's kind of funny that this little part is so powerful, but I think it's the part we forget the most. You know, God is with us until the end. Um, we always forget that. We tend to think we're on our own, whatever it may be, but God is with us. Um, so in the New Testament, there's this word, it's called dunamis. It's a Greek word for power, and it's used about 120 times. And it's kind of, it's where we get the word dynamite from, but not why you would think. So when you think dynamite, you think power, you think explosion, right? And you, y'all know this one, but that's not the idea behind it. The word dunamis quite literally means the power residing within a thing. So we get dynamite because you have that little stick of dynamite and there's a whole lot of power in that. Um, you light that thing and there's going to be some power. But the idea is that it is used as the Holy Spirit has the pow- is residing in us and we have that power. And again, that doesn't mean that like you're going to get saved and there's going to be a magical beam of light and like a little like Casper the ghost looking thing is going to come down and come inside of you and all of a sudden you're going to have like superpowers. It doesn't mean that like when it says you have the power of Christ inside of you, it doesn't mean like you can literally turn water into wine. I mean, that would make some really crazy church potluck, so we would never be able to do that. Um, but it does mean that we have the power of the God who when he said, when he told the oceans to part, they moved. When he said, when he told the, um, the, the ocean to be still, the ocean stopped. When he said, look, the blind would see. When he said, walk, the lame would get up and praise him. And when he said, healed, lepers were clean. And most of all, when he said, rise, the dead got up and walked right out of their tomb. We have that power within us, but half the time we don't even act like it because when he tells us to go, instead of getting up and going and doing, we park it on the couch and open Facebook. It's because we forget that inside of us we have that same power. We have him there. He's there to give us strength, to give us courage, to guide us. That He's there to do what when he calls us to do something, he's going to provide what we need to do what he has called us to do. Um, I like this. This is my quote here, so when I'm famous, you can remember this. It said, when we are in God's will, following God's plan, we will never outrun God's supply. He gives us everything, or he has given us everything that we are going to need to do whatever he has called us to do. Um, Notice how I said that we need. Um, I know there's a lot of things that we want and we think we need for a to go do what God has called us to do, but you don't need a brand new car, you don't need a giant house, you don't need that that really nice fishing boat to go do what God has called you to do because he has already given it to you or he's going to give it to you on your way. So when we're going to go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, we've got everything we need or we're going to have everything we need. We just got to do it. It's that simple. So to kind of go back to the idea earlier when I talked about moving and it was difficult, well, I didn't want to just leave it as talking about how bad it was. So God, as I said, God has provided everything I needed. You know, when I moved to Greenville, yes, it was difficult, but there are all kinds of people here in this church that supported me. Um, God gave me all kinds of new friends. God gave me, I'll shout him out, James um, to help me. I would never have known what I was doing when I got here if I didn't have James helping me and being kind of my plug at the school to show me around and do everything. Um, God he gave me a washer and dryer finally. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's funny. I, that's, I, that's actually really serious for me. Um, God gave me pretty much everything I could have need, and I know that as I continue here, he's going to continue doing that. Um, so, it's, it's not like it's just something that the Bible says. Like, I can promise you it's, it's personal and it's real. And you may not have noticed it in your life. You may not have, like, physically experienced it or literally seen it, but it's there and it's happening. And maybe you might not see it, but other people will. So I kind of, I just want to give us a challenge today. Um, I think that as a modern church, we have this view, like I said, of making disciples as Simply getting someone to pray and confess a belief and move on. 
But in reality, like I said, that's not it. That's just the start of the process. Um, Each and every believer in this room, including myself, could be doing a better job of it. I mean, each and every single one of us could be doing a better job of making disciples. Whether you're here and you're just going to move here, or maybe you're here and you're going to move up here. It doesn't matter. There's, There's always room for improvement because we're never perfect. So maybe for some of you, um, making disciples just means instead of letting young ones or whatever look to be made disciples of pro athletes, maybe being made disciples of musicians and singers and celebrities and all that, maybe for you making disciples means instead of letting them be made a disciple of that, maybe for you it's going and throwing the ball with that person. Maybe it's going to those uh, band concerts, no matter how boring you may think it is. Maybe it's going to um, those theater things. Maybe it's whatever it is. Maybe, maybe you love theater and you hate the sports, but you're going to go to both anyways. Maybe it's the other way around. Um, it might even be for someone that's not your kid. It doesn't have to be for your kid. Um, now, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say to overstep those boundaries. Obviously, there's things that are meant for parents and things that are not, but that doesn't mean you can't disciple them. Um, Maybe it just means you need to relax a little bit and worship and finally truly worship how God is calling you to worship. Um, You know, it could be a lot of things. Maybe you need to come come be up a new uh, smiling face up here in the choir. Uh, Maybe you need to come up here and just bring a little little joy, and not that we don't have any, bring some more joy up here. Um, Whatever it is, um, God is calling each and every one of us to make a disciple. Maybe some of us, it just means quit opening the excuse book when something comes up. Maybe it means that just because I did something on Saturday doesn't mean, isn't going to give me an excuse not to show up to church on Sunday. Maybe it means, oh well, just because my kids are tired, uh, I'm going to let them skip church. Maybe it means I'm going to make them show up to church, and on top of that, I'm going to show up with them, because when when I make them go and I leave, it sets just as bad an example as not going in the first place. Maybe whatever it means, it means just no more excuses. Um, Maybe some people just aren't a disciple of Jesus in the first place. So in a second, we're going to have another song. We're going to have a little time to sing and do a little more worship. And I just want to invite you to take care of whatever God is calling you to do. Um, I don't know what that is. I can't like point each and every single one of you out and say, Hey, this is what God is telling you to do. Hey, God wants you to go throw the ball. God wants you to be a Sunday school teacher. I can't do that. Matt can't do that. Nobody here can do that except for you. You know what God is calling you to do. Maybe um, you need to sit down in your seat. Maybe you need to come up here and kneel and just ask God to give you a little bit more courage to, to go make disciples. Maybe you need to ask God for a kick in the pants and get you off the couch and let you start going and start showing you. Maybe uh, you're doing great in that, and you need to ask God, hey, just give me a little more encouragement and help me keep going, That help me keep doing what I'm doing. Um, And Maybe for some of you, it's just time to take that first step um, and actually become a disciple of the Lord first. You know, maybe you're still the, the sponge that needs to be rinsed under the living water first so that way you can spread that water out to everyone else. Um, Whatever it is, though, I just want to encourage you not to walk out of here and not take care of what God is calling you to do. So that being said, let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this wonderful day. Um, Thank you for this this wonderful church, Lord. And I I pray that um, you just encourage us and empower each and every one of us to just continue to make disciples, Lord, just to continue to go and to, to drop all the excuses, Lord. And I just thank you for not sending us to do that by ourselves, Lord, as you said, that we have power that you've given us, Lord, that you are, you are with us as we go, Lord, that you, you always provide what we need to go, Lord. And I just pray that whatever it may be um, that you are calling us, that you just continue to poke at us, Lord, until we go wherever you're calling, Lord. And I just pray that today we all walk out of here a little bit closer to you, a little bit closer to you, and a little bit closer to each other. In Jesus' name, amen.